you like my lunch? Are you Irish? I'm having fun. the end, we're doing a cover story on Ortega, and uh, well, no matter how the boat goes, and uh, so on, before I leave, I'd like to just uh, a few of your thoughts uh, beyond the boat, just generally about that part of the world and uh, your feelings. Uh, but let me, let's start out something a little, uh, a little longer lasting, and uh, I guess, uh, let me put it in terms, if you were a, if you were a professor, and uh, had a class now, after five years of being here, mm -hmm. what would you tell your students about yeah. this office? Oh, about, oh. About being president. That well, I suppose I'd describe it, you in the, in what I feel about it. Uh, some people become president. Uh, I've never thought of it that way. I think the presidency is an institution over which you have uh, temporary custody, and it uh, and it has to be treated that way. For example, uh, presidents that have come in and uh, drastically changed traditional things, or uh, selling the yacht <laughs> or something. <laughs> Not that I'm a yachtsman. As long as I got my horse, I'm happy. But uh, anything, I just don't. Uh, I've never tried to do anything of that kind because I don't think it belongs to the individual. It belongs to the institution. And uh, that would be one thing. The other thing, uh, I think I'd be tempted to point out to them how in recent years uh, Congresses have tended to uh, try to curb and take away from the presidency, from that same institution, some of the prerogatives that belong there, uh, the handling of foreign policy and so forth, and placed restrictions uh, on the office that in effect uh, would have sometimes a, an attempt to have foreign policy determined by a committee of 535, the, 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 namely the legislature. But uh, other things though, I think I would also tell them that I've enjoyed the job and that uh, some nights you go home feeling 10 feet tall. <laughs> have you had more of those than the other? Well, uh, uh, I've had, I guess, a fair sprinkling of them. What would you, looking back, what's been your best moment? Well, well, actually, one, it's a kind of an ongoing moment. Uh, moment. You know, it's the, the fact that all those years I was out on the mashed potato circuit and uh, making after-dinner speeches and uh, being a luncheon speaker and all and talking about what I saw over the years this was long before I was governor, as the inordinate growth of government, the adversarial relationship with the business community, the interference too much with other levels of government and with the people's rights. Uh, and all those years that you looked at Washington and the government was waging a fight over that growth and there were some trying to slow it or prevent it and others insisting on more government power, government moving into new areas and so forth. I think one of the things I'm happiest about is that after 50 years, for example, of almost unbroken uh, deficit spending with this great growth in the social reforms and so forth, that that other fight over all those years is no longer the fight. There's no quarrel about deficit spending the only argument now is how to control it. Well, for almost a half a century, they were telling us that deficit spending was good for us. And that there was no problem with having a national debt. It, uh, we owed it to ourselves. And they would talk about deficit spending as being, encouraging prosperity and so forth. But today, 
to see the total change in the debate that goes on in, in government and in the Congress particularly is a debate now uh, not between those two uh, views of government, but simply a debate of how to bring down spending, how to curb the deficit. Well, is this the Reagan age? <laughs> well, I wouldn't how be so it? bold as to put my name on it, but it, it, I think it represents a drastic change in the view of government, of the federal government. I remember back in 1932 when I cast my first vote and it was cast for Franklin Delano Roosevelt and in the depths of the, of the Depression. And most people today are astounded to learn or to be reminded that Franklin Delano Roosevelt campaigned on a program of cut federal spending by 25%, eliminate useless boards and commissions and agencies, return authority and autonomy to the states and local government that has been unjustly seized by the federal government. So you're back where you started, you think? Uh, yeah, only I have to wear a different trademark now. <laughs> it doesn't fit the Democratic label. You seem to work harder than ever. Now, you told us uh, earlier that you weren't going to be a lame duck, but uh, uh -huh. uh, it looks to me like the hours get longer, the issues get thicker, the fights well, get tougher. Maybe because that's some other people thought it might be a lame duck. Uh, no, I, I learned in, uh, happily in my second term as governor, Hugh, that, that well, actually we accomplished more in the second term than in the first. You're just getting revved up in that first one and beginning to um, whittle away at things, and then it was in the second term that we got the, the great welfare reform, which I think was probably the most drastic reform of welfare that's ever taken place since welfare Are you going to be able to do that on a national basis? I'm sure trying. And you're going to do yeah. it right up the well, end. Well, we're talking tax reform now. Mm -hmm. uh, this program, of, uh, which is people have talked about it uh, over the years, but no one has ever brought it mm -hmm. to the point of where we're actually mm -hmm. trying to get it implemented. Uh, we're talking a reform of welfare that has long been a dream of mine, and that is that if welfare was properly run, we would be boasting each year how many people we had been able to rescue from welfare, not how far we'd been able to, expend it to extend it to more people. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be all out yeah. for the next two and a half yeah. years. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to coast. You wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> the ranch doesn't pull you? Oh, always. Huh? But then I learned that a long time ago, too, uh, that the the job, they can talk about you being on a vacation. Nancy put it once correctly. Uh, presidents go, don't get a vacation, they just get a change of scenery. <laughs> you're still, you've still got the job, it's still with you when you're there. Well, that's fascinating. Let me switch gears here and go to our part of the Central America, if I may. Somebody has said that your, your uh, doctrine is talk loudly and carry a big stick, that you're doing both. Uh, uh, <laughs> What is it down there uh, about the application of American power that is so frustrating? Uh, well, the one cancer that has to be excised is Nicaragua. Mm -hmm. But when I came into office in the beginning, I had for a long time looked and worried and thought that we hadn't done what we should properly do to bring these countries of the Americas into more of a real relationship. Yes, we've gone down there with various programs and said to Latin America, uh, let's have a good neighbor policy or this or that. But it was always the big colossus of the North going down and telling them what the plan ought to be. And that's why very early on I made that trip down to South and Central America, not to every country, but uh, to some key countries. And actually, Hugh, I went and when I met with the leaders down there then, I said, what are your ideas? that in reality we all, we all worship the same God virtually in this, in this unique hemisphere. We all have the background of coming here as pioneers and roughly at around the same period of time. And we should be far better friends and have a closer partnership uh, than we've had. And I think that part of it was there was a time when 
the big colossus from the north uh, was seen as just interfering and sending the Marines and all this sort of thing. So the, everyone can talk about what were some of the patterns down there, military governments, uh, dictatorships, uh, great wealth and great poverty and nothing in between and all. Now, in these several years, we have seen where it was once only about a third of the countries in this hemisphere could be said to have uh, democratic forms of government. Today, 90% of the people in Latin America are living in democracies or in a few countries that are still making their way toward that. And there are only one or two places where they still haven't managed to bring about democracy. And one of the most glaring is Nicaragua. But what has happened there was a hijacking. The people of Nicaragua set out to get rid of a man who was certainly, you couldn't call a totalitarian, but an authoritarian government, and a government that there were areas of corruption and so forth, the Somoza dictatorship. And they did in a revolution. And actually, they did a, a thing that was a little different than a lot of revolutions. They, the revolutionaries, appealed to the Organization of American States and asked them, said, would you ask Somoza, this was during the revolution, to step down so we can end the killing? And the Organization of American States said, what are your revolutionary goals? And they told them, democracy, pluralistic society, free trade, freedom of religion, all the things that we treasure. And Somoza stepped down. And our government, this was before I was here, our government immediately started to give financial aid to the revolutionaries to help them establish this government. But there were in, among the revolutionaries, there was one central nucleus, which was an organization that had existed before the revolution, the Sandinistas, a communist organization. And the man himself whom they honor, Santini, he said he was a communist, that this was the, the way to go. But they hijacked the revolution. They ousted their other allies in the revolution, and some of them very forcibly and in oppressive ways, and drove some of them away and some just fled. And then they established a totalitarian communist regime, the same process that Castro employed in taking over Cuba. And just as we wanted the people to make the decision in the Philippines. We want the people to make the decision in Nicaragua. Can you work with Ortega? I mean, is there any possibility that The you only see? possibility that I see, we've made 10 attempts mm -hmm. to, to negotiate uh, with them. But when have we ever seen a communist government once installed totalitarianism voluntarily give up their power and uh, say, well, okay, do you want to have more democracy? We haven't. Now, the people that formed the Contras, that began to want to take back their revolution, they repeatedly have said to us, yes, they are willing to lay down their arms and seek a negotiation, a political settlement that will get back to the goals of the revolution in letting the people make a decision and have, have elections. The same thing that the, that the people in El Salvador succeeded in doing. It's kind of curious that the communist-backed guerrillas in El Salvador that are still fighting against that democracy that the people have now voted three times for are the same and are helped by the government of neighboring Nicaragua. And the so-called Contras are the exponents of democracy akin to the El Salvadoran government. That's why Duarte right now has said he will negotiate with the guerrillas in his country if the Sandinistas will simultaneously negotiate with the Contras. What rules of application of American power do you go by at this time in Central America? What guides you in? Because we still are the Colossus of the North. But if we can be of help go. this way, if we can try and help those people who want freedom to bring it about themselves. When Ortega shows off recently after 10 attempts by saying he wants to negotiate with me, by what power would I be able to go in there and negotiate for the rights of the Nicaraguan people? But I do feel 
that we have a right to help the people of Nicaragua who are demanding what we think are any mm -hmm. people's rights, the rights to determine their own government. And uh, I know one thing, all of this talk that I'm nursing an ambition to send in the troops. Mm -hmm. No, I came into office several years ago and when I told you about those thoughts about the rest of the country with the knowledge that to send in troops would lose us every friend in Latin America. Their memories still are of that yeah. other way and that would be the worst thing in the world that we could do. But they're not even asking. That's one thing that all of them, they say to us, they want us to help the Contras, but not with troops. Now, whenever there's been a mention of interviews with CAP or congressmen asking something about when or how would we send in troops, mm -hmm. the only thing we've ever uttered and that I've uttered is a warning that if this revolutionary well, the Sandinista group is allowed to continue to solidify their base. And they themselves, the documents reveal, they intend to spread that revolution to other countries. Now, with us dependent on the Caribbean sea lanes for more than 50% of all of the things that our economy must have, we see that the only thing that could happen if this goes on and they continue this expansionist policy with the backing of the Soviet Union by way of Cuba, there might come a day then when their act, hostile acts would be directly against us. And a situation then when it wouldn't be going down to try and run someone else's government, it would be protecting ourselves. How do you judge that? Huh? Well, this is what I see could happen yeah. if, this, if this goes on. A direct threat to yes. us, to our sea yes. lanes or something like yeah. that. And suppose there's trouble someplace else. Suppose we have to go to the aid of our NATO allies. Half of everything that we would send would have to go through those same sea lanes. We only have to look back to World War II. With a very few submarines, the Germans with their own bases 4,000 miles away did some of their worst damage in the Caribbean to our shipping there. So there is a time when we could say, well, the threat is to us now. But right now, we just simply see a people that obviously want to have a democracy and there are their own people there. To, to portray the Contras as having been the remnants of the Somasistas, no. In fact, the three of the three leading political leaders now of the Contras, two of them were imprisoned by Somoza. You know that the average age of the Contras is 20 years? The youth of Nicaragua is in the Contras, and they have an esprit de corps that is just amazing to see. They believe in what they're doing. I see. I, somebody's signaling me. <laughs> Are they looking over by I've you? I've talked too much. You asked no, too good no, a question. No, that's precisely, that's, <laughs> uh, that's fine. Uh, but one of the things about your record over f uh, five years now is the, uh, is the restrained use of power. I don't know yeah. if there's any uh, calculation, but we've probably sent fewer troops and uh, portions yeah. of our fleet around the world uh, uh, now over in this period than a similar period uh, for quite a while. Uh, this, this is a deliberate uh, calculation of yours. Yes, I mean, but you talk, uh, you talk very forcibly well, though. Yes, there are things, uh, mm -hmm. as for example, that first uh, naval maneuver uh, that crossed the line that uh, Gaddafi calls uh, mm -hmm. his line, and oh, yet yes. it isn't, it's an interference with international yeah. waters yeah. and so forth. Uh, there, the, they came to me and the mm -hmm. Navy, and they said they felt that if we didn't do this, if we didn't continue, we've traditionally, that's been a, an area for maneuvers in that part of the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. And they said, there will be some ships and planes that will cross that line. They said, we need guidance as to what do we do if we're threatened with hostile action, if someone takes, if Gaddafi takes hostile action. And I have said one thing, uh, yes, we've used restraint, but I said, anytime our men are fired upon, 
we fire back. Mm -hmm. And if you remember, yes, they came out, attacked two of our F-14s, mm -hmm. and uh, we mm -hmm. shot them down. Yeah. And uh, that, I'll always uh, stay with that. But, um, and we have, we have some more maneuvers coming up again, and they're the same kind of maneuvers we've done before. But the other thing, I have to think that the, the hardest decision anyone in this job can ever make is asking those young men in uniform out there to go into some situation where, well, look at the tragedy that befell us in Lebanon. Mm. Now, why was that terrible terrorist act done to those Marines in, there at the airport? We were part of an international group, the United Kingdom, the French, and ourselves, gone in to try and maintain some order while the new government of Lebanon tried to get control of its own countryside and take authority away from some of the uh, private armies that are still there. The truth of the matter is, we were succeeding. And it was because we were succeeding. I have a letter I could show you from a mother who wrote to tell me that for the first time in eight years, her daughter was able to go to school, mm -hmm. like other kids, to leave the house and yeah. down the street to school. I have a letter from a, from a young woman who was uh, engaged to a, to a young man in Lebanon. And he wrote to her to tell her that if it wasn't for us, and our allies being there, doing what we were doing. He said there's never been anything like it. He said there would have been massacres by now. Well, because this was beginning to straighten out, those who wanted the trouble had to take action. Yeah. And that action resulted in that suicide bombing of, yeah. of our men at the, at the air base. Back in the Caribbean, though, with uh, Mr. Ortega, and the possibility of a commitment of American troops. Are you absolutely satisfied that you've exhausted every opportunity for negotiations, to talk to them, to bring in outsiders, the whole yes. work? Yes, what we need. Yeah. See, that's another thing that I do believe. Restraint, yes, but diplomacy mm -hmm. must have behind it the strength mm -hmm that there are things that, that you can do. And in this instance, I don't think that they are going to uh, agree to all the things that Contadora has been asking of them, mm -hmm. and everyone else has been asking of them. They're not going to do that unless they feel the pressure of the Contras. And they felt that pressure before 1984. Mm -hmm. and, and the Contras were doing very well. But in 1984, the Congress shut off our ability to help. Finally, we got that $27 million of humanitarian aid, band-aids and so forth, and I don't underestimate them. They need that too. But from 1984 on, uh, they have been shrinking in size because, not because they don't have volunteers. They have five times as many people willing to serve as Contras as were in the revolution against Somoza. But they can't fight if they don't have the tools. And we've been prevented to give, from giving them the tools. This is why we've asked for this. And this is new money. Mm -hmm. This is 100 million that comes out of the defense apportionment. Mm -hmm. But we feel, yes, we would start from the minute they, the Congress would give us the authority uh, to provide these, these materials, we would start again to negotiate, believing that there now would be some added pressure on them, just the knowledge that these countries are going to have the weapons, and then if by that time they still don't show any inclination, well then the countries are able to do what they've been doing. They're out in the countryside. I think they have the support of the people out there in the country, and the Sandinistas are governing a s smaller and shrunken and continuing to shrink populace that supports them. Uh, you'd be surprised how many of the Contras are deserters from the Sandinista mm -hmm. army. Much as this is also waged in the minds of people, isn't it? I'm talking about your idea that if we grant aid, the perception then that we'll continue to back them and help, yes. help the Contras and means much yes. in the struggle. Then the Contras have to look at one of two choices. 
the possibility of an outright military defeat mm -hmm. and being totally overthrown, or a choice of having a political settlement in which, while they would have to give up this monopoly they have, mm -hmm. at least they would still be in a position to run for office and seek mm -hmm. office if they could get the people's approval. Yeah. Mr. Ortega said you weren't rational the other day, but did you... Uh, <laughs> reply to him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't find him very rational. Well, he's rational in his belief, and that is he is a dyed-in-the-wool believer in a totalitarian Marxist government, which he has. Isn't it strange that people haven't noticed that the ruling body consists of nine officials? Isn't that exactly the size of the Politburo in the Soviet <laughs> Union? I think they got a hint from over there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. President, thank you. That's well, great. I think I got two columns out of that. You know? <laughs> the way I work well, it here, you've got to use all the, all the uh, time you can. Well, good luck on it here. I guess the, uh, the vote coming along, is it? There? I, we, I, we're hearing some, some uh, signs of optimism, but it's not an easy fight. We're going to fight right down to the wire. We'll still be meeting with them. But I don't know one of the things is I don't see how the, uh, how the Democrats walk away from that. I think that's a hazardous point. I do too. I mean, I uh, you too. know, in, in those terms, anyway. Uh, I don't follow the reasoning otherwise either. <laughs> and most of their, you know, you, yeah. most of their, their uh, arguments just don't have a basis. In fact, no. one of the things, some of them say, well, yes, we will go along, but we want your diplomatic settlement. So they would like a waiting period before the, and the weapons could be given. And then they would like another vote out there. But at that time, if we'd shown signs of being able to negotiate, so that then they would approve the weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, that is self-defeating to begin with. First of all, you then adopt the Sandinistas and say, well, look, they don't really want to give those weapons. They got another, they're going to have to vote on it again before they can be given. And they've got an interim period in here. And wouldn't it be natural for the Sandinistas with their Soviet gunships and their tanks and so forth to say, we've got X number of days to knock them off. And they would rev up the offensive action against them. I'm glad you got the problem. I, mean, <laughs> I guess we all have, but I think it's going to work out. I think it's changed the way my instincts tell me. Listen, don't you, don't you get the feeling a little more and lonely on the Agassi show? Are you telling me? Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, about four to one, you know. Oh, I tell you, Nancy, I just got the dread on the stage when you're not on the panel. And when you're there, you are a yeah. lone voice. Well, you've got Jack. Yeah. Jack. They just don't shoot the camera very well. Oh, I know. Yeah, I know you've got it. Yeah, it's where I'm going there. But we, we had the two of us there last time. Hopefully, it won't in there. Yeah. Strange, though. It's the same mindset that you're not going to do on the hill, you know. But you've done it this way forever. I'm going to keep doing it this way. Good. I call them the plan of the first year. Yeah. <laughs> Good to see you again. Yeah, all right. I'm going to keep it. Oh, there he is. Oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to admire you guys. Well, perfect. Well, it's a good fellow. Yeah. Okay, best of luck. Thanks.